Uh, let's see, I've been working at, uh, on UC Berkeley campus for about 21 years. About 17 or 18 of those have been with the SETI group. I started working at SSL, just sort of doing more just really minor tech, administrative stuff. I was a computer guy. I uh, studied computers in college and all that, but I don't think anybody at the lab really knew what my skills were because I was just sort of there as a temp job. One day, just sort of out of boredom maybe, I was just sort of poking around the system to see what was, you know, what was going on in the network. And I did issued some pseudo commands, and those of course showed up on Jeff Cobb's computer, and he was just like, wait, what's Matt doing with sniffing around? So he asked me, Do you, was that you who issued those commands? And I was like, yeah. And I was just looking around to see what was going on in these systems, and he says, do you know all this stuff? And I was like, well, yeah. He was like, well, okay. And basically invited me to help him out, long story short, just started working on the SETI group. So yeah, the moral of the story is uh, hack your computers at work and maybe you'll get a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, Serendip 3 was ramping down and Serendip 4 was uh, ramping up. So when I came on, I was mostly just helping do the final data analysis for Serendip 3, which was an incredibly small amount of data compared to what we're dealing with now. But at the time, we were on these really old sun systems and literally just like cranking out plots on pieces of paper and looking at them and saying, is this ET? No, okay. And then Sadie at home just sort of started coming around. And at the time, it was almost kind of like a well, I wouldn't use the word distraction, but maybe a little bit of a distraction, like what is the SETI at home thing? Okay, well, it's kind of a neat side project, but we're really working on this servant at four stuff. One of the challenges with SETI at home is sort of this embarrassment of riches of, uh, of data to analyze. Um, meaning, uh, back with servant at four, you know, our data set was pretty small and we were kind of able to manage it internally. Now that we have all these computers around the world processing data and just, you know, throwing at us, it's great, but it's actually a challenge to just keep this stuff in databases that are stable and working. It takes a long time to kind of turn the crank. It's basically, you're trying to match signals. And so imagine a game of concentration where you're trying to match two cards, you know, you know the game of concentration, you have all 52 cards out and trying to match pairs of cards and see which one's there. But just imagine instead of 52 cards, there's a trillion cards. It takes a while to kind of match those pairs up. We found some stuff that was like, okay, this is sort of interesting. And then we, uh, we, enough that we had some telescope time at Arecibo and we went back to analyze it and um, none of them really showed up again. <laughs> none of them showed up again. One of them kind of showed up again, but it was just, there was enough error and enough looking at it that it's like, it was pretty clear that it was RFI, uh, radio frequency interference, basically earthling noise. Until we have a telescope on the dark side of the moon or somewhere else, it's gonna be chronic problem trying to do SETI here on Earth. We might have ET, we just haven't like actually pulled it out of our database yet. People get concerned that we're not analyzing our data in time order. Sometimes we'll resubmit something from 2008 or 2009 because we realize the analysis of that got messed up somehow. So we, we put it back in the pipeline and people get upset like, oh, you can't analyze data from 2009, we gotta analyze the new stuff. But the problem is, it's like, yeah, it's like we are really only turning the crank on this data every few years, A, and B, we don't really know when ET is transmitting and see even if they are transmitting and it hits us in 2014 who knows how far away they are it's kind of timeless really so it's not really it's kind of asynchronous one project that we started working on that kind of just fell to the wayside a little bit was uh, this near time persistency checker NTPC for short and so we just started calling it nitpicker um, but what that is, is a system that was able to read from our database as new results were coming in, rescoring them, and coming up with interesting top 10 candidates day by day. So that the data analysis was just too slow to do in real time, so that project got fell by the wayside. And we don't really have the server resources to have a zillion replica databases and make, and make it faster, or as fast as we would like. That's one thing we'd like to do, is just much faster data analysis. Uh, we kind of seem to be choked just by our own server uh, and manpower resources on that front. We've actually made strides on this. We've mentioned this uh, when we were uh, first starting to get the, the near-time persistency checker rolling. We definitely, we got a couple of great servers as donations from people. People uh, self-organized and created this uh, donation group to say, oh, they need this kind of hardware. Let's everybody chip in some money and get it, get it for them. And that worked and it was great. We're sort of in flux right now because we recently moved all of our servers from the Space Sciences Lab to the co-location facility. So we can't really grow at this point in time, but uh, we still need help uh, and we will need more servers <laughs> in, in the future. So yeah, if you can help <laughs> donate some money to SETI at home, we, we always need money for hardware because we're 
choked. <laughs> I've been able to learn so much about computing, about astronomy, about SETI, just on the job. Sort of, I always plan to go back to grad school, but I never did, because this has been my sort of perpetual grad school. 